first question is based on preemptive shortest remaining time first and the second one is on a counting semaphore s so uh, doing the first question first the question is consider the following processes with the arrival time and the length of cpu burst given in milliseconds the scheduling algorithm used is preemptive shortest remaining time first the average turn around time of these processes is so turn around time is basically completion time minus the arrival time and to find the completion time we need to make the gan chart or how these process will processes will be executed so starting with the gan chart initially at time 0 we have only one process which is p1 okay so we start executing p1 till the point of time when another process which is p2 arrives p2 arrives at point or arri at time 3 by that time p1 has executed 3 units and the remaining time of p1 is 7 units okay so since the scheduling algorithm is shortest remaining time first so the remaining time of p1 is 7 and p2 the remaining time ha is six so we'll choose p2 over p7 and we'll preempt p1 so stop p1 at time 3 and start executing p2 okay we'll execute p2 till time period 7 at time period 7 since we have a new process we'll check and wait to see if the new process has a shorter remaining time first oh or a shorter remaining time so at point 7 we see that p2 has executed four units so um, at point 7 yes it has executed four units and the remaining time for p2 is two units but the process p3 that has arrived at point 7 it has a remaining time of one which is shorter than p2 and p1 so we'll execute p3 first now p3 completes its execution in one millisecond and at time period 8 we have another process p4 p4 has a remaining time of 3 p2 has a remaining time of 2 and p1 has a remaining time of 7 so the shortest out of all these four is so i'll cancel this so that you don't get confused the shortest out of all these four is p2 will p3 is already complete so we'll schedule p2 and we'll schedule p2 for the next two seconds see from the time when all the processes have arrived shortest remaining time first will now become shortest job first because it will never happen that a shorter a process that you have selected will become larger as compared to another process or another process will become shorter if a particular shortest process at a particular current time is executing okay so if the last statement confused you just remember and you will see when you solve the questions that from the time point when all the processes have arrived the shortest remaining time first algorithm becomes shortest job first because here P2 is the shortest out of all the three, 7, 2 and 3. And if we keep executing P2, it will never happen that out of P1 and P4, any of these would become shorter than P2. Then after P2, we would select P4 because P4 is shorter than P1. Okay, so we select P2 and execute it till 2 units, that is time period 10. P2 has completed its execution. Then we schedule P4 for four for three time units. And at the end, we schedule P1 for seven, seven time units. And this will go till 20. Okay. So let me write down the completion time for P0, P1, P2 and P3. Completion time of... Okay. So there is not P1 p1 p2 p3 and p4 so arrival time completion time and turnaround time okay arrival time of p1 is 0 3 7 and 8 completion time of p1 is 
for completion time you read the gan chart from right to left so 20 then 10 c then 3 8 and the last one p4 completes at 13 now Turnaround time will be completion time minus the arrival time. So 20 minus 0 is 20. 10 minus 3 is 7. 8 minus 7 is 1. 13 minus 8 is 5. Okay. So this is your final table. And from this you will find out the average turnaround time. Average turnaround time is given by sum of all the turnaround time divided by the total number of processes. So average is equal to 20 plus 7 plus 1 plus 5 divided by 4. This sum would come out to be 27 plus 6 which is 33 by 4 and the value would be 8.25. So the answer is 8.25 milliseconds. Please remember that if you are uh, doing this question in gate numerical type questions, then it is sometimes specified that you have to find the answer till two decimal places or one decimal place. So stick to that instruction and write your answer accordingly. So coming to the next question, the next question says that consider a non-negative counting semaphore the operation PS decrements the value of semaphore S and VS increments S. During an execution, 20 PS or 20 decrement operations and 12 increment or VS operations are issued in some order. The largest initial value of S for which at least one PS operation will remain blocked is Okay, so the main points to consider while reading or to underline and keep in mind while reading these question is that it is a non-negative semaphore, non-negative counting semaphore. So what does that actually imply? Basically, you can decrement the value as long as the value of this semaphore is positive or greater than zero. Okay, PS decrements the value. It decrements the value and V of S increments the value. Okay, so if initially value of S is equal to 0 and there are 12 increment and 20 decrement operations to be performed in some order. So since 12 increment operations and 12 decrement operations can be performed and the value of this semaphore would retained would be retained to its original value 0. So if initially S was 0 and you increment it 12 times and decrement it 12 times, the value would again be 0. Alright, so now we have a remaining of 8 decrement operations. Okay, 8 PS operations are remaining or 8 decrement operations are remaining. So what would be the largest value possible or what should be the largest value of s so that at least one ps operation remains blocked okay so now you can think about this question in this way that if i assign the value of s to be 8 okay if value of s is 8 then i can decrement it 8 times i can perform 8 ps operations such that the value of s comes out to be 0 but I do not want this to happen. I want at least one PS operation to remain blocked. So what would be, what could be the next possible value that I could choose? Since it is given at least one operation to be blocked and I have to find the largest such initial value. So if I do, if I assign S equal to 7, then I will, I, be able to perform only 7 PS operations and 1 PS operations would still be blocked. Okay, I have met this condition that at least 1 operation is blocked and this is the largest value. Why is it the largest value? Because this S equal to 8 was a value which resulted, which would have resulted in performing of all such 20 PS operations and if we decrement with the minimum value of 1 
then I get the maximum possible value. So when you have to gain a maximum value for something, you decrease the value by the minimum amount. All right. So if you initialize this counting semaphore with a value of seven and you perform such 12 increment and 20 decrement operations, there will be at least one PS or decrement operation that will remain blocked. All right. So how can you do this? You can keep on increment performing 12 increment performing 12 decrement operations in some order and then you can perform the remaining 8 PS operations. Okay. Or the some some order that keeps one PS operation blocked would suffice in this case. The only thing is that you have to select the largest initial value. So the answer is 7 in this case. I hope you understood both these questions. Both of them came from very important topics from operating system. One is scheduling algorithm based and the other is based on semaphores. So if the question, the question says that consider a machine with a byte addressable main memory of 2 raised to power 32 bytes divided into blocks of size 32 bytes. Assume that a direct mapped cache having 512 cache lines is used with this machine. The size of the tag field is dash bits. Okay, so one thing that you need to understand very clearly about main memory and cache is that main memory has certain number of blocks and the size of cache is generally smaller than the main memory because cache is a fast memory and the size is generally kept small. So a cache has multiple cache lines and each of these cache lines map multiple blocks. Okay, so in this question, we are given 512 cache lines. 512 cache lines means 2 raised to power 9 lines. Okay, 2 raised to power 9 lines. Also, we are given that the size of the main memory is 2 raised to power 33. 2 raised to power 32. So, main memory size is given to you as... 2 raised to power 32 and size of each block in the main memory is equal to 32 bytes. This is also 2 raised to power 32 bytes and size of each block is also to th is 32 bytes. So the number of blocks that would be present in the memory and that need to be mapped to the cache would be the total memory size 2 raised to power 32 divided by 32 and 32 can be written as 2 raised to power 5. So we are writing as 2 raised to power 32 divided by 2 raised to power 5 and this would come out to be 2 raised to power 27 blocks. So the total number of blocks that we have are 2 raised to power 27 and all these 2 raised to power 27 blocks need to be mapped to cache or some cache line they need to be mapped to some cache line okay now since as i told that the size of cache cache is smaller than the main memory size so each cache line maps multiple blocks therefore each cache line will map how many blocks it will map the total number of blocks that is 2 raised to power 27 divided by the total number of memory line cache lines that exist which is equal to 2 raised to power 18 therefore each cache line maps 2 raised to power 18 blocks of the main memory now since the tag field tells us the size or the number of blocks that are mapped to each cache line therefore the tag field size is equal to 18 here and why is it equal to 18 because 2 raised to power 18 blocks can be mapped by each cache line and therefore they can be represented by 18 bits okay so you can 
also answer this question by drawing the sub fields of the address that means if you draw an address for mat and you write down the fields in it the sub fields the sub fields are tag field the set field and the block size field okay block size field so the tag field is the one that you have to find out its size you have to find out the length of this address is 32 bits okay so a total of 32 bits are present set field set field is basically the cache lines so 2 raised to power 9 lines are present in the cache so the size of the set field is 9 here and the block size is given to you 32 which is equal to 2 raised to power 5 so here the number of bits required to represent all these blocks are 5 so total of 32 and bits we subtract 9 bits that are required to represent the total cache lines and the 5 bits that are required to sub to represent the block size so subtracting 32 and why is it 32 because a total of 32 bits are required to represent the entire memory because the memory is 2 raised to power 32 so 32 minus the number of bits to represent the set field that means the cache lines is 9 minus 5 which gives you 32 minus 14 which gives you 18 all right so these are the number of bits in the tag field that would be present and that is your answer so this was the question that is not very difficult you need to remember how, what is the relation between the size of the memory the number of blocks and the mapping between the blocks and the cache lines so if you understood this question please like this video and share it with your friends and tell us in the comment section below how did you find it keep watching and subscribe to our channel of easy engineering classes to get our more videos on this preparation series as well as other computer science related subjects subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get the notifications of our upcoming videos so that you don't miss a single one Thank you for watching. Stay tuned. Good luck.